everyone welcome back to doctor talks today we will be dealing with potassium disorders this is will be a two part discussion first will be a hypokalemic discussion and second one will be an hyperkalemia so potassium so what is this potassium this potassium is the major intracellular cation there are two types of ions intracellular and extracellular this potassium is the major intracellular ion and the sodium is one of the most important extracellular ion the total body potassium stores are 3000 approximately 3500 milli equals per liter this is the total body stores of this total body stores 98 percent of the potassium is intracellular and two percent of the potassium is extracellular uh, what the usual the, uh, the intracellular potassium your usual values will be between 150 150 milli equals per liter this is the intracellular constituent and serum potassium values will be around 3 to 5 uh, 3.5 to 5 milli equals per liter this is the usual uh, serum potassium value the normal dietary requirement of potassium will be around 60 milli equals per liter this is the normal dietary requirement uh, of potassium so this is the intracellular potassium so these are the some values about potassium so how does the potassium handle in our body potassium is pre predominantly handled by the kidneys especially the distal convoluted tubule in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct these are the major site of potassium handlers in this distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct three major components are responsible for potassium secretions remember the potassium almost all the potassium that is reabsorbed that is filtered at the glomerulus gets reabsorbed at the proximal convoluted tubule uh, other than this there will be an entity called as potassium secretion which occurs in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct this potassium secretion depends on the serum potassium value the hyperkalemia the increased aldosterone levels when there is increased free water or sodium increased free water or sodium delivery to the distal convoluted tubule there will be increased excretion of potassium in all these entities so normally the difference between sodium and potassium is that in potassium uh, almost all uh, in normal uh, human being itself there will be some amount of potassium that is lost in the urine 20 milli equals will be lost in urine if this 20 milli equals that is lost in urine is not replaced uh, by if you if you get replaced the patient with potassium deficient iv fluids then that patient has got a higher chance of developing hypokalemia now coming into causes of hypokalemia you can classify the causes of hypokalemia into three groups the first group will be the uh, ones with the transcellular shift by uh, the definition of transcellular shift i mean there will be shift of potassium from the serum component into the cell thereby causing serum hypokalemia uh, the transcellular shift uh, occurs in case of metabolic alkalosis respiratory alkalosis alkalosis of any cause especially the metabolic and respiratory alkalosis uh, then the treatment for hyperkalemia all those things can cause hypokalemia mainly beta 2 agonist namely sarbutamol this beta 2 agonist can cause hyperkalemia by causing a transcellular shift and this insulin the insulin can also cause transcellular shift of the potassium from the serum into the cells this is the transcellular shift of potassium the second group will be the decreased intake of potassium the decreased intake of potassium this can be secondary to malnutrition or administration of fluids without potassium we continuously giving plain water or FID. these patients can develop this potassium deficiency and the third group of people are having increased excretion non-renal excretion of potassium non-renal loss of potassium so what are the conditions where there is non-renal loss of potassium say vomiting diarrhea frequent nasogastric aspirations 
profuse wetting all these conditions will have loss of potassium which is non renal in these patients if you see the urine potassium values the urine potassium will be less than 15 milli equals there will be renal conservation of potassium because this potassium is lost elsewhere now coming into the most important group this will be the renal loss of potassium the renal loss of potassium can be because of either because of diuretics the, the, if you, especially this loop diuretics loop diuretics can cause hypokalemia and uh, then osmotic diuretics then uh, conditions with um, salt losing nephropathies water syndrome gentleman syndrome water syndrome gentleman syndrome Cushing syndrome or any form of steroid giving, given to the patients or it can be secondary to primary hyperaldosteronism or secondary hyperaldosteronism, secondary hyperaldosteronism, secondary to renal artery stenosis or any cause. Here the urine potassium will be more than 15 milli equals per liter. So, uh, these are the major causes for potassium uh, loss. So, uh, we will straight up go to the approach of potassium. Uh, in the approach of potassium, first thing is we have to, we have to confirm the hypokalemia. Uh, once one value or two are values uh, of hypokalemia alone, don't evaluate. If the patient is having persistent hypokalemia, the, both the laboratory values or the symptoms of hypokalemia is persistently present, then you have to measure the first, you have to go for the urine potassium. As we all know, the urine potassium will be normal. Uh, I mean, urine potassium will be increased in renal losses of all the renal causes of potassium loss will have an increased urinary loss of potassium. So, the hypokalemia means there is a low potassium level in the blood. This potassium can be lost because of three reasons. Either they can be lost via urine or the non-renal form, vomiting, loose stools, diarrhea, uh, profuse sweating, other form or transcellular shift into the cells. These are three major entity. First, we rule out the transcellular shift by all these causes. Any do an ABG or metabolic alkalosis, respiratory alkalosis, history of any salbutamol treatment or insulin infusion. We rule out first, we rule out this transcellular shift. Then, uh, if the urine potassium is less than 15 milli equals, then you have to uh, rule out other conditions like vomiting, diarrhea, nasal respiratory sweating. Those should be ruled out. Then. Uh, you, you have seen the urine potassium loss is more than 20 milli equals per liter. Then you have to go for evaluation, you have to go for doing an ABG, you have to do uh, blood pressure, you have to measure the volume status, extracellular fluid volume status. You can basically classify this condition into three groups. Uh, the first group will be the hypokalemia plus metabolic acidosis this can be secondary to a, say DKA in the, and the renal tubular acidosis the type 1 and type 2 forms or secondary to drugs like amphotericin B they can have hypokalemia with metabolic acidosis if the patient is having hypokalemia plus metabolic alkalosis then the blood pressure becomes an important thing uh, with the patient is having increased BP hypertension then you have to think in terms of excess say Cushing syndrome some non-narcotic activity should be more this can be uh, classified as Cushing syndrome or it can be secondary to uh, Korn syndrome Korn syndrome is the primary hyperaldosteronism or it can be uh, secondary to secondary hyperaldosteronism or it can be secondary to other conditions like apparent mineralocorticoid excess and glucocorticoid remediable hyperaldosteronism or it can be secondary to other conditions like uh, Liddell syndrome. Now all these conditions you can have uh, this hypokalemia. So how do you approach a patient with hypokalemia? 
first repeat the potassium values there should be a pro, uh, consistent hypokalemia that is the first thing secondly you should do for an abg abg showing acidosis or alkalosis thirdly do for blood pressure whether there is hypertension or a normal tension uh, this conditions if there is hypokalemia plus metabolic alkalosis plus normal blood pressure you have to think in terms of barter syndrome or a gentleman syndrome or uh, other conditions uh, like vomiting diuretics this condition comes here so uh, we have seen the different causes of hypokalemia and how do you approach a case of hypokalemia now going into the clinical manifestations of hypokalemia so hypokalemia can have three main findings first is the muscular findings muscular findings in the form of uh, the, any the patient can present predominantly with the lower limbs lower limb will have fatigue myalgia and weakness this is the musculoskeletal symptoms starting then second one will be the smooth muscle problems smooth muscle problems in the form of there will be paralytic ileus and constipations and there will be decreased ur defective urination and urinary retention so constipation and urinary retention along with muscle weakness lower limb an element type of weakness uh, uh, in lower limbs and then thirdly it can cause uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus it can form as uh, polyuria polydipsia and increased uh, frequency of urination this is because hypokalemia when itself cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and fourth one will be worsening of hepatic encephalopathy because hypokalemia can increase the renal ammonia formation that can worsen the hepatic encephalopathy in a patient with liver failure the other findings will be the cardiac findings the cardiac findings can have they can have atrial arrhythmias ventricular arrhythmias digoxin toxicity anything is possible in the cardiac patients so the cardiac problems can be found out by doing ecg electroencephalogram so just look at this is the p wave this is the qrs and this is the t wave this is the normal ecg this is the p this is the qrs and this is the t wave first uh, the first change in hypokalemia will be the flattening of t wave flattening or inversion of t wave this occurs at a value less than usually less than 3 milliequals per liter uh, the t wave will go it go for either flattening or it will go for inversion anything of this is found this is the first finding the second finding will be the appearance of u wave the u wave will be in a uh, second wave along with the t wave the t wave and and u wave so this wave will be the u wave and this one will be the d wave the appearance of u wave is the second finding that is seen the third finding will be the uh, uh, prolongation of qt prolongation qt prolongations so this is the q wave and the d wave normally the qt interval is present here this qt will be prolonged up to let's say there will be qt prolongation uh, qt prolongation this is the third finding then the patient will go for qrs prolongations uh, this qrs interval will go for widening and pr prolongation this pr interval will go for widening so qrs prolongation pr prolongation qt prolongation u wave flattening of inversion of t waves and finally the patient can develop um, where various type of atrial and ventricular arrhythmias at the end stage now coming to the treatment of hypokalemia how do you manage a patient with hypokalemia so first thing is that uh, the treatment of hypokalemia requires uh, basically three things first one will be the giving a potassium rich diet the potassium rich diet in the form of bananas they can technically large amount of bananas they can go for coconut juice tomatoes all these are potassium rich diet and they can be given to patients with hypokalemia uh, the one the patients have not have much hypokalemic laboratory evidence of hypokalemia the values is between say 3.5 to 4 and the patients having no other symptoms then you can go for potassium rich diet alone second thing you can do is that you should reduce the dose of diuretics reduce the diuretic dose 
Suppose the patient is receiving high dose Lasix 40 mg BD reduced to 20 mg BD or any other diuretic higher dose should be reduced. Go for third one will be the going for potassium sparing diuretics. The potassium sparing diuretics can be added as an add-on therapy to uh, this reducing the dose of diuretics. Then comes the potassium replacement. Potassium replacement. This is the major treatment for hypokalemia patients. So there are few things which you should know before you go for a potassium replacement. The first one will be that uh, if we have to ensure the patient is having adequate urine output. So if the patient is having oliguria, he is more likely to have something like an AKA or a CKD. In such patients, if you either give potassium or if you are uh, giving drugs like AC inhibitors, ARBs, all these drugs can cause risk of hyperkalemia. So any patient with uh, suspected AKA or CKD or any patient who is on AC inhibitors and uh, ARBs, potassium sparing diuretics, think twice before starting replacement because hypokalemia per se has got a better prognosis than hyperkalemia. Uh, acutely hyperkalemia can cause deterioration but hyper so never go for over correction of potassium, always under correct potassium to be on the safer side. Then the potassium replacement. How do you replace potassium? Two methods. First one will be the oral replacement. Oral replacement the KCL fluid. The syrup KCL can be given uh, 20 milli equals can be given uh, three to four times a day. This is the usual prescription. Syrup KCL can be given 20 milli equals three to four times a day. Mix it along with water taken after food uh, because it has, has, has got some chance of gastritis, esophageal uh, er erosions, small resilient erosions, all these things are possible. So syrup KCL can be given. If there is mild hypokalemia, if there is severe hypokalemia, you can raise the dose up to 40 milli equals. Up to 40 milligrams can be given, but then uh, higher, uh, very severe hypokalemia, we don't go for oral correction, we'll go for parental correction. So, either syrup KCL can be given 20 milligrams or 40 milligrams, whatever dose can be given. Then, parental correction. The parental correction is given with uh, the injection KCL. Usually, 15% KCL is what is given. Uh, one app will have 10 ml of KCL, will correct 20 milligrams of potassium. So, 1 ml of KCL has 2 milligrams of potassium. That is the uh, dose that is present in 1 ml parental correction. Usually, a 20 milliequal of potassium correction will raise the serum potassium by roughly say 0.25 milliequals. Suppose the patient is having potassium of 2.5. You give a correction of 20 milli equals over one hour. The raise you expect will be just 0.25, 2.75. That will be the raise you will get. So, what is the maximum dose of correction? And what are the problems with potassium correction? First thing, uh, uh, if you could correct more than 40 milli equals uh, in the peripheral line, they can go for thrombophlebitis. If you go to correct more than 40 milli equals, you have to go for uh, central line. Also, the maximum limit that can be corrected per day is maximum of 240 milli equals. Uh, you should, practically we don't correct more than 160 milli equals but 240 is the theoretical maximum uh, we can correct potassium thirdly uh, the potassium is uh, so say if the patient has metabolic acidosis and you correct them with soda bicarbonate that can cause worsening of hypokalemia and also when you over correct uh, direct IV potassium if you give uh, that's a blunder and the patient can go for instant cardiac arrhythmia and sudden cardiac arrest so never go for direct IV potassium correction so potassium correction preferably should be given in a normal saline should be given in a normal saline and given slowly over a period of say uh, 2 to 3 hours, uh, 2 milli, uh, two ampules, say 40 milliequals should be corrected over a period of 4 hours. So not more than 10 milliequals uh, should be given per hour, uh, that will be ideal. The problem with this uh, um, dextrose containing solution is that dextrose containing solution can worsen the alkalosis, uh, should not be given, uh, either we have to preferentially correct in a normal saline, not in other solutions. So, adding and high and potassium in certain fluids like isolate M, they have high amounts of potassium and it is not necessary to give uh, KCL in such uh, high potassium fluids that is not to be given. Just preferentially you have to go for KCL correction in a normal saline. So, this sums up our discussion on uh, hypokalemia. We will next deal with hyperkalemia. Thank you.